Good afternoon. For those of you who were able to join us yesterday, welcome back. And for those of you that missed yesterday's session, welcome. My name is Sarah Z. I am the Digital Marketing Specialist at School Health Corporation, and I will be today's webinar moderator. You have joined part two of Evidence-Based Prevention of Infectious Diseases in Schools, and we'll be covering the importance of surface hygiene. I'd like to welcome back our presenter, Yatao Liu, PhD, the Senior Manager of Global Medical and Clinical Affairs at Metric. Before I hand it off to Yatao, I would like to go over a few things about today's webinar. We will not be taking audio questions, but we would like you to submit your questions via the questions interface in GoToWebinar. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Yatao is planning to take about 45 minutes for his presentation, and we will leave the remaining time at the end to address your questions. This webinar will be recorded, and a link to it will be posted on the schoolhealth.com website, as well as emailed to you for future playback and review. Everyone who attends today's webinar will also be receiving a certificate of attendance for joining us today. This certificate is not CE credit, but you may be able to submit it to your professional organization for them to issue credit. You can expect to receive your follow-up email containing the link to the recording, copy of the presentation slides, and your certificate in about five business days. Also, today we will be asking you to participate during the webinar via two audience polls. Please listen for your opportunity to participate and quickly select your answer. We will share the results of the poll with the group right afterwards. And with that, I would like to hand it over to today's presenter, Yatao. Oh, hey, Sarah. Um, hey, everyone. So if uh, you joined yesterday's seminar, so we'll actually talk about some fundamental principles of infectious disease at school, uh, school settings. Today, actually, we're going to focus on the case study, basically look at the evidence-based role of surface disinfection, which will involve hand hygiene and uh, surface disinfection. All right, let's just jump into the webinar. Uh, this slide we have actually we showed yesterday. So this slide tell us basically is you know the pathogens we're dealing with, virus, fungi, and bacteria. They're very very small. We actually are able to see them by our naked eyes. And as I was saying, you know, eyes never lie. Actually, sometimes you know, even we cannot see them, they do cause problems. So this is just you know a fresh of memory. They're pretty small. And this slide is basically showing. For the different pathogens, actually, they have different resistance towards, you know, either antibiotics or disinfectants. And here we talk about, you know, disinfectants. They have different resistance profiles. And uh, why they come? They actually show different degree of resistance that actually linked with the outbrain structures. For example, the spore they actually have the protein shield to protect them. The mycobacteria has actually very thick. Uh, cell membrane layers. For gram negative bacteria, there's also membrane layers, and some proteins can shoot off some disinfectants. And for gram positive bacteria, we have very thick layers, peptidoglycan. glycan. And for wires, we have envelopes and non-envelopes. That's why the membrane structures determine the degree of resistance. So this is a fundamental you know, mechanism for the resistance. And in this slide, we talk about, you know, we heard about a lot of, you know, the rising anti, uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria, the superbugs. And from another perspective, why we have actually the superbug issues. The reason, actually, one way is, you know, we kind of like abuse the antibiotics. That's why the bacteria to develop the resistance. However, from different perspective, as you can see from here, this figure I explained yesterday, too. The number of new antibiotics approved by FDA actually is linearly uh, decreasing with the years. Why? What's the reason that? Actually, there's no, you know, incentive incentive for the uh, pharmaceutical companies to develop antibiotics. On average, it takes the pharmaceutical company about 10 years, one billion US dollars, to develop a new antibiotic. 
and uh, the patent, by the time FDA approved, they can come to the market. The patent protection actually has been left probably only you know 50% or even less than that. And uh, for the bacteria, it won't take about seven years on average sometimes to develop the resistance. So with that being said, it's very hard for the pharmaceutical company to actually get the investment back. So that's a different perspective when we're trying to look at the superbug issues. However, for us, you know, this, no matter what the reason is, but the situation is not, you know, optimistic for us. So which put the infection prevention at a very important, you know, uh, important role. So that's why, you know, we have to find a way to prevent the infection happen at the first place so we don't face any issues without the, you know, the proper uh, antibiotics to treat the infections. Then for the pathogens, we understand, you know, all the different pathogens, they can cause infectious disease. And today we're going to focus on the environmental uh, impacts on the infectious disease. Then the first question is, okay, so if the pathogens can be transmitted through the environmental surfaces, and the first question come is, how long can those pathogens survive on the uh, environmental surfaces and being infectious? This actually a very good study. This is a review paper published uh, two, um, nine years ago. Summarized uh, many different pathogens, as you can see. For example, the C. diff yesterday, uh, someone asked the question about the C. diff. The C. diff actually, the spore, you can, it's not surprising, it can survive on the environmental surfaces. Actually, this is dried surfaces for up to five months. It's kind of not, not surprising because the C. diff in spore uh, formation is kind of like a dormant, so they can protect it itself. So that's why it can survive for a very long time. However, the surprising thing is for some very common pathogens, for example, E. coli. We know that E. coli is very common, and uh, some E. coli can even survive on the dried environmental surfaces for up to 16 months. That's very shocking data here. And also for other common pathogens, for example, Klebacilla, mycobacteria, tuberculosis, smallness, originosa, staphylococcus aureus. As you can see, they all can survive a very long time, actually, from, you know, like uh, two hours to, like, up to 30 months. And uh, this study does not summarize some virus. For example, the most common one would be the flu virus, influenza. Influenza, according to some study, it can survive on the dry surface from two to eight hours. So still, you know, very long time, two to eight hours. So we understand that the pathogens, they can survive on the dry surface for a very long time. So will they cause problems? Let's actually jump to some studies here. Let's look at uh, norovirus. Remember yesterday we talking about the pathogenesis, which uh, important aspect is the transmission routes. So for certain pathogens, they have their preferred transmission um, pathway, which means they have to actually to uh, transmit a certain mucous membrane to be able to in, uh, infect, to launch the infections. And for example, the norovirus. Norovirus is a very famous virus, which can cause, you know, sometimes we call the stomach bug, can cause diarrhea or vomiting and uh, its transmission pathway actually is through the GI tract. So you actually have to eat something to be able to get a norovirus infection. This is a CDC uh, survey. As you can see, um, for the two years period, CDC summarized all the 15, uh, 1,518 documented norovirus out outbreaks in the United States. And the majority of the norovirus outbreak actually in long-term care facilities. In school system, about 4%, and a cruise ship, you know, we saw the news all the time about the norovirus outbreak on a cruise ship, one account for about 4%. But the impact is actually very big, because why? This is just the number of outbreaks, because the cruise ship and the school settings, we act very crowded, right? We have a large population over there, so the impact in the school setting actually is pretty big. And as you can see, actually about 7% Americans contract norovirus on the yearly base. 
and as we said, pathogenesis normalizes is a GI tract virus. So, what is the function of the environment play in the norovirus infections? Let's actually look at this issue. It's very interesting, right? All right. So this one actually, if you look at the text the textbook from like uh, three decades ago, then basically the traditional norovirus transmission pathway, as we learned yesterday, is through many through the GI tract, which means actually you have to go through the food contaminated with the norovirus water, or even actually from the environment, it has to go through actually the the vehicle. Basically, is the food to be in back, to be in able to launch the norovirus infection on human. And let let's look at actually a test study. This study actually converted. This is actually a real outbreak of situation investigation by the Department of Health in Washington County and uh, Oregon. So that's actually a setting in car dealership for the car salesperson. On Sunday, they had a they had a step launch. Actually, the step launch they actually ordered food from different vendors, and uh, then they had the launch. And uh, 20, within 24 hours on Monday, five people started to showing a symptom of vomiting and diarrhea. And following the next day morning, six people showing such symptoms. Then this apparently is a you know outbreak. And the first thing you know people may think about, okay, it probably is food poisoning. And maybe they actually, you know, add some foods contaminated with norovirus, you know, because this is the most common transmission pathway. Then they trace back, they found actually not coming from because of food coming from actually different places. So since that's not coming from the food, then where was it? Then the investigation going on, they found actually on Sunday there's actually some diarrhea incident in the actually in the bathroom. And for the diaper changing station, it actually got contaminated because of the diarrhea incident and some norovirus left on contaminated the surface. And then people contracted with the surface and also people use the door handle of the bathroom. That's why the norovirus actually basically has spread it from one person to an environmental surface. And then from the environmental surface spread back to people then got actually not a virus of the bread. So the message here what we can learn from this case study is not a virus actually can trans, can be transmitted from the indirect, which is formite surface, to direct to the mucous membrane, the GI tract. So from this case study we can see what's the role of the environmental surface is playing. Uh, this actually most uh, peer-reviewed studies talking about what's the role of environmental surface playing in transmission of the norovirus infections, as you can see from another study. So this study actually combined the hand hygiene and the environmental surfaces um, in the setting of norovirus, con norovirus contamination. So what did this study do? This study do basically is, you know, you actually, they, the researchers wear the gloves and then use the finger to touch some fecally contaminated toilet, uh, toilet tissues with a uh, norovirus contamination. Then they use a finger to touch the clean surfaces, which is a uh, melamine surfaces. Melamine surfaces, very common surfaces. For example, the classroom, the you know, the desk actually is melamine. And also many countertops, they're melamine surfaces. They use actually the contaminated fingers to touch the surfaces. As you can see, they continue, continuously touch the clean surfaces. So for the first touch, norovirus can be detected. And for the second surface can be uh, detected. Even up to seven surfaces, actually, norovirus can be detected. What does that mean? That means, actually, if one surface is contaminated with norovirus and the people accidentally touch the contaminated area, and then Consequently, they can touch continuously different clean areas. All the seven clean areas will be contaminated by the norovirus. This study actually is very rigorous. So to prove actually the all the rest of the area norovirus detection coming from the original finger contamination, they did actually molecular agnosis as we mentioned yesterday. So what is the uh, 
So what they did actually is they used as a reverse actually PCR assay to confirm the transferred norovirus actually is coming from the contaminated material by the fingers. So the conclusion is norovirus is cons uh, consistently transferred by the fingers to melamine surfaces and from the contaminated surfaces to other typical and the contract surfaces such as tap, door handles, and and the interesting note is if you just use detergent based cleaning method with a cloth, that actually does not really that will actually fail to eliminate norovirus contamination because why you just push around the norovirus without really actually disinfect the norovirus. We will talk about this later. So from this case study again we learned that even norovirus is a GI tract virus, but the transmission actually can be done from the indirect formite surface to direct to the GI tract or the mucous membrane. This, this study actually was done about 10 years ago, and nowadays actually people realize, okay, even we're talking about norovirus is a GI tract virus, however, the environmental surfaces play a very crucial role here. And there's a very nice finger, uh, figure here. As you can see, traditionally we think norovirus actually can be transmitted by food, by water, or by the direct people-to-person-to-person uh, -person -to -person contact. And now, actually, we realize the environmental surfaces play an important role, which actually can transfer the norovirus to food and to people. Only we have to do the disinfection to to cut down actually the transmission pathway to prevent the environmental mediated transmission. I think this figure actually is very interesting and also very important. So what does this figure show? This figure shows basically the comparison between direct transmission and the environmentally mediated transmission. We know, you know, lots of pathogenic uh, disease can be transmitted by direct uh, transmission, which is person-to-person -person direct contact, either skin-to-skin -skin or other direct contact. As we can see, actually, the y-axis is infectious intense, basically is infectious dose. We can see that when the infectious dose actually can go very high, because why? Because, you know, when the infections happen on a person, the dose can go, can shoot very high because the either bacteria or the virus or fungi, they can multiply, accumulate to a large amount and then spread it to other people. So the degree is actually is very severe, much actually severe than the uh, infectious dose can be spread by the environmental surfaces. However, for the even the degree is pretty high, it does not last a long time. It won't last actually a few days. For example, influenza probably lasts about four day, anywhere from four days to one week to be in, infectious, you know, through a people, through person direct transmission. However, the trade-off for in, environmentally mediated transmission, even it does not shoot very high for the infectious dose, but it can last for a long period of time. This actually is just showing the norovirus, this norovirus actually can be remain on the environmental surface and be infectious for about, you know, two weeks. So for other pathogens, as you can see, as a function of how long they can survive on the dried environmental surfaces, they can continually become a source of infectious infection transmission. So this is, you know, it's very interesting a comparison between direct transmission and the environmental mediated transmission. Then mm -hmm. let's uh, switch the gear from norovirus to another virus to a cat study, which is, you know, Staphylococcus aureus. Basically, also can be the massa meningitis resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And yesterday, also a person asked a question about the massa. Let's just look at the massa. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So for Staphylococcus aureus, it's a gram positive bacteria. Actually, it is a normal uh, bacterial flora on the on human skin and on different human parts. For example, on the left side, as you can see, on the for the general population, about 27% of people you can detect 
uh, Staphylococcus aureus in the nose. And also from different body sites, you can detect the Staphylococcus aureus. They don't really cause problems. So it's part of the natural flora for human beings. And for the Staphylococcus, actually, uh, neural carriers actually can see for the nose 100%, they can detect the Staphylococcus aureus. And without looking all the every single body part, body site, let's just look at two sites. One is the nose. Here, for the general population, if we can see, remember the number, 27%. And then let's look at the hand, also 27%. Let's look at it, actually, the Staphylococcus aureus carrier. Then we can see the nose, 100% positive for Staphylococcus aureus. And for the hand, it's 90%. Did you see some link here? 27, 27, 100%, and 90%. So is that a coincidence or is there some logic behind that one? So next slide, actually, I'm going to ask a question. And I would appreciate uh, your participation to give me your opinion. All right, Sarah, actually, we're going to launch the poll if you know we can get some help from you. OK, I'm going to launch the poll. And if you can select the radio button for your choice. Um, that will be great. We'll tally the results in just a minute. Great, we see those coming in. Thank you, everyone. Give it one more minute to let everyone who would like to vote, vote. OK, last chance to vote. I'm going to close the poll, and we will share the results. All right, thanks, Sarah. I uh, appreciate your participation. And uh, let's look at the results. So you know, how many times do we touch our face during one hour, right? And it uh, looks like majority of people think you know, we touch more than 11 times. I think it's true, right, for especially in the school settings for the students, right? Like, I, I don't know how many times my son actually touched his face during for one hour. Let's actually go back to our you know, presentation slides. And uh, according to the study, actually, let's see how many times you know, uh, people touch our face on um, during one hour. People touch our face actually about 3.6 times per hour. So not as dramatic, but still you know, considerable numbers, right? 3.6 times we touch our face. So, but the point is not how many times we touch our face. The point is we do use our hands to touch our face. And we use our hands all the time to touch different surfaces. If the surface is contaminated, as we know, those pathogens, they are invisible to us because they are too small, right? So there's actually a possibility we may transfer the pathogens from the contaminated surface to our face and rubbing our nose, face and nose, so we can get a contact with our mucous membrane and, uh, you know, the different transmission pathway will be bridged. So this is actually the take-home message here. And also, actually, I would appreciate again for your participation for the next slide's poll. Sarah, we're going to get some help from you again. First. All right, let's do this poll. OK, I will launch it now. All right, if everyone can vote. I'm sure many of our listeners work with teenagers, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> teenagers probably have a, a different category than the rest of us. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. I agree. I agree. <laughs> OK. It looks like just about everyone voted. Uh, one more moment to submit your request or your choice. OK, great. I'm going to close it, and we'll share the results.
Okay, so this time, you know, I think that you know our attendees become more moderate because last time, right, majority vote, you know, choose like we touch our face many times more than eleven. So this time we kind of like saying we check our cell phones to you know between anywhere forty one to eighty times. This looks like majority here. All right, let's go back to the presentation slide and see how the study, you know, found out what the result is. So according to the study, actually, we average user check their cell phone nearly actually about 150 times per day. I mean, the first time I saw this number, I was shocked. I was shocked actually here with my colleagues. So we did actually try to trace down how many times we check our cell phones. Until actually you do the study, you actually will be really surprised. We do actually check our cell phone. For me, actually, I checked my cell phone more than 150 times. Actually, I didn't realize that one. So it's very interesting. And as far as said, you know, for the teenagers, they probably actually, I think the number will go even higher. But the point is actually, it's not like you know, stuck with the exact number. How many times we check it? And again, the important message here is. This message is just want to show you, you know, how frequent we use our hands to touch different surfaces, and those surfaces actually how you know most likely will be contaminated. You know, like when we put our cell phones, you know, at different places, the pocket, you know, the the desk, the desk, right? And also, not only just cell phone, but different environmental surfaces, since we use our hands that frequently. But right, so. More and more, actually, peer-reviewed studies they found that environmental surfaces play multiple roles for the infectious disease transmission. For example, the recent study is saying that when even you lifting the lid on a toilet actually will produce the aerosol, because we know actually lots of pathogens they actually when it can be transmitted through the air, which we call the airborne pathogens. So. Looks like you know traditionally we're saying there's nothing to do with the environmental surfaces, but with actually the importance of the environmental surfaces be realized by more and more people, and then research have shown that when even you lift the lid, basically you disturb the environmental surfaces, which may produce the aerosol pathogens, make the pathogens from the environmental surface becomes airborne. So that analysis on how important environmental surface is, and more and more study. So I want to go through you know the very detailed study here. Basically, this study actually showing the viral infection, indoors infection actually can be acquired through airborne droplet and contact transmission. So what does that mean? That actually means all the three different transmission modes: airborne, direct contact, and fomite. Traditionally, with you know, we saw the three kind of independent, but more and more evidence showing the three different transmission mode actually they are interlinked. They can be bridged. And what's the bridge? The bridge actually is environmental surface. So that's actually with the new evidence and the new study, kind of like a, you know, let us ask a question. You know, how do we actually our current cleaning program dealing with the spread of massa and other pathogens, even like the influenza, because traditionally or even measles, traditionally we think, oh, they're just you know, massa is skin to skin direct contact, influenza and measles are yeah, respiratory you know virus, or bacteria a virus, so the one can be transmitted through the airborne or even the direct contact. So now, more and more studies showing, oh, actually, we have to think about another important, you know, component here, which is environmental surface. In the hospital settings, actually, the environmental surface has been well recognized. So if you go to any hospitals, you can see they actually have very standard procedure to do the surveillance and to do the surface disinfection. I think in the public domains, actually, the awareness is starting to picking up, and so we actually kind of realize the importance of environmental surfaces. So back to the norovirus. So I want to conclude the norovirus case study by showing the final results here. This is actually also CDC survey. Basically, summarize the three years, um, 
three years period norovirus outbreak because traditionally we re we realized norovirus is a GR tract virus, and as we can see here, indeed for the foodborne outbreak of norovirus, we count for a small you know percentage of the all norovirus outbreak. Actually, the non foodborne norovirus outbreak counts majority. What is non foodborne norovirus transmission, which actually through the environmental surfaces. That's why, you know, the key message we understand here is environmental surfaces can bridge transmission pathways and play a key role in infectious disease. So this is actually norovirus um, conclusion, uh, concludes actually our case study here. But I actually want, also want to show another slide is so we realize how important the environmental surface disinfection is and hygiene is. And then we may ask a question, so does that mean surface disinfection and hand hygiene can prevent all infectious disease because they're so important? We can bridge the different transmission pathway. Well, many of them, but we have to bear in mind, not all of them. For example, TB. TB, tuberculosis, actually caused by a bacteria called mycobacteria tuberculosis. As we understand the name, right, species name is actually linked with the disease name. So TB actually is not spread by any of the direct contact or by the environmental surfaces. This is actually the CEC language you can see here. So TB is not spread by shaking someone's hands, share food or drink, or even actually you share toothbrush or touch the common environmental surfaces. And for TB, is there any vaccine? Yes, there's a vaccine for TB. However, the vaccine is not very effective. So that's why in the United States, we don't actually promote the TB vaccine. So what is the basic you know, prevention way for TB? Usually, you know, we have to separate the uninfected people with the infected people. And also for the environmental control, we actually really have to control the amount of TB in the air. So the message here, I want to show you that one, because today we talk about a lot, you know, the environmental surface and hygiene, very important, but we have to bear in mind that some pathogens actually it still cannot be transmitted through the environmental surface. TB is one of them. Just want to bear that in mind. So this slide is actually showing the increasing public threat due to antibiotic resistance. So as I said, you know, I show this figure all the time because this is actually a real public health threat. Most people sometimes don't realize, but it's happening, it's real. So I put two figures together here. On the right side figure, we already understand, which is actually the number of new antibiotics approved by FDA decreasing linearly with the time. And on the left side, as you can see, actually the antibiotic resistance of different pathogens, they're actually increasing with the year. If you overlay the two graphs, they actually kind of like, you know, inverse proportional to each other. So they kind of link with each other. But the message is, you know, with less and less new antibiotics available and with more and more bacteria, they develop resistance. The infection prevention has been put into a very crucial role. So the infection prevention will become more and more important to the knowledge of microbiology and to the knowledge of the correct prevention way is vitally important. As you can see, very shocking number. Over 2 million people actually become sick because of antibiotic resistance. And 23,000 people died because of the antibiotic resistance in the United States alone. Quite a shocking number here. CDC actually does have actually some guidelines regarding the cleaning and disinfection as part of broad approach to prevent infectious disease in school settings. And to understand that one, actually, we have to understand uh, a few terminologies here. Because sometimes people get confused about cleaning, disinfecting, and uh, sanitizing. So what, what does that actually mean? That means actually cleaning means just remove the germs, bacteria, and uh, disinfecting means actually can kill the germs, either virus, fungi, or bacteria. 
and uh, sanitizing only means actually reduce the number of germs. So cleaning does not even kill any germs. Sanitization will kill usually actually that's three log, which is 99.9 percent .9 pathogens, and disinfection that's five nine five log, which actually is 99.999 percent .999 germs. That's why you can see actually disinfecting give you the highest level of protection. Yesterday, actually, someone asked a question about you know some consumable of available products, for example, Lysol. Right? Does that actually provide some protection? Yes, because that's EPA registered. But if you look at that product, actually, that says sanitization. So which which means want to give you actually certain percentage reduction does not give you actually disinfecting. So this is actually some comparison you want to see. And another thing is we want to know the difference between the things actually is in school system for the daily sanitization can actually for uh, for the high touch area which actually can reduce the uh, infectious disease uh, infectious pathogen load such as you know common touch areas and uh, for some actually high touch areas, standard procedure often call for disinfecting, especially like the bathroom or the door handles, which actually would be touched frequently by many people, students, right? And also, of course, you know, we want to actually when we clean the surface, you know, we'll always as a universal precaution, we want to have the actually PPE, which is a personal protection equipment, on, like the, the goggles, you know, the gloves to protect ourselves for any unknown pathogens may present on the surface. Um, as we said, you know, we understand the EPA registration, so any product should have an EPA registration. Then the last is important is you have to know your product, especially the instruction for use, because an important parameter here actually is the contact time. Contact time basically means, you know, how long it has to maintain the wetness, basically, you know, the surface has to maintain the wetness to become efficacious to against those pathogens. And the different products, they have different contact time. And for the normal settings, you can give a try, you know, you wipe down the surface to see, you know, how long does it take for those liquid evaporate from the surface, you already take, you know, very short of time, you know, less than, you know, three minutes sometimes, majority of the time. So that's why for some products, if you see a contact time of five to ten minutes, that probably will actually put a question mark, You because you have to actually apply that product continuously maintain the wetness to be efficacious. And uh, we do actually offer the product, you know, actually made for the professional settings, for the hospital settings, for example, our carry white carry side one, which is one minute product. What does that mean? The one minute means one minute contact time actually can take care of the, all the common pathogens, very broad spectrum, virus, fungi, and bacteria. And another is hand hygiene. Hygiene, we actually have the single use uh, and it, and it, you know, antiseptic toilets, you know, which actually is nice settings. When students going to lunch, you know, everybody gets one. So sometimes, yeah, you know, actually cannot wash hands. You can just wipe down, doing the wipe down. So to prevent any possible pathogens transmitted from the contaminated surface or hands into their GI tract, into their, their mouth and, you know, to the stomach and the small intestine accordingly. So with that being said, you know, all the best, you know, performance one can be be acquired by the evidence, the best knowledge, and by products, and most importantly, by the practice. That's why we're trying to have the joint efforts to, towards the prevention of infectious disease. And uh, with that being said, thank you for your participation, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much, Yatao. Um, so yes, we have a couple questions already, and please feel free to type your questions into the questions interface, and we can address them. We have um, plenty of time. The first question is, what are your thoughts on using essential oils to fight infections and or to boost the immune system? Oh, that's actually a very great question. 
uh, actually, I did research on essential oils for about three years. So first of all, essential oil actually have very efficacious, you know, across a broad board of different pathogens, including virus, you know, bacteria and fungi. And uh, another thing, actually, I would say is they actually they are not sometimes they are not biocidal; they are biostatistic, which means they inhibit the growth of pathogens. Does not really kill them, but some do kill them. But a concern actually is the safety. Because why? Because most of the essential oils they are kind of like a they also can cause some allergic reaction either for the respiratory system or on the skin. And uh, as you can see, you know, this, this, they have pretty strong smell. So that's kind of a concern when we try to use essential oils. So there's some cons and uh, some pros. That's why in the product, you know, market, market uh, available products, you don't really see lots of essential oil based products because that's simply concern here. Good point. Um, the next question is from Sue. How often should the bathroom in the health center be steam cleaned? Uh, the steam clean actually kind of like, you know, as an analogy, like a hospital, you do a terminal cleaning. So you can have actually the air and some hard rich areas be disinfected and cleaned. So that one, usually, you know, you have to actually go with your state, you know, regulation or the guidelines here. But usually, you know, you probably want to consider once a week or any, you know, big accidents happen. For example, the diarrhea incidents happen. So you probably want to do that one because some liquid, the splash may go to some hard to reach area. So a regular base, probably weekly basis or unless some, you know, accident happened, you want to do that, you know, after the accident. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. The next question is from Teresa. Would you recommend Vinex rather than soap and water for children prior to eating? Uh, I would have said actually the running water and the soap will always be the best way to get rid of pathogens, as I explained yesterday. Not necessarily actually we want to kill or you know, disinfect those pathogens on our hands. As long as we can get rid of them, actually, we will be free of any you know, pathogen transmission. But we have to consider some certain situation, especially for the students. You know, sometimes they, can, they, don't, they are not willing to wash their hands. Even they wash their hands, actually, the minimal time they should wash their hands, actually, is 20 seconds. Can they really wash their hands for 20 seconds? So if that happens, so sometimes we may consider the alternative. But to answer your question shortly, soap and water will be the best. If we can stick to the best practice, I would recommend that. Okay. Um, great. How long can flu virus live and potentially infect a person after being deposited on a surface? So that actually, as I said, you will anywhere from two hours to eight hours on a surface. Okay, great. How long can environmentally mediated transmission last for norovirus? Um, this one, um, as we uh, saw on the slides, actually can last up to two hours for the norovirus. Okay, great. So the yeah, so the surface, you know, can continuously be, be the source of, you know, contamination and uh, norovirus transmission. Okay. Um, do you feel bleach is an effective, low-cost disinfectant, and how long does it need to stay on the surface, for example, to kill norovirus? Uh, you said bleach, right? Bleach, yeah. So for bleach, actually, we have to watch out, actually, is a concentration of bleach. Because to, to be efficacious, usually, actually, we're saying, you know, when in 10 bleach, actually, that actually is 0.6% bleach. And uh, for 0.6% bleach, uh, very efficacious, usually, that actually takes only, actually, um, at minutes, about three minutes, to kill, you know, the common pathogens, including the norovirus. However, a workout actually is two things. The first thing is 
you have to get the fresh bleach because bleach is a strong oxidant. It's not stable, so it will de degrade it very quickly with the time. So that's why you have to get a fresh bleach. The second watch out actually is the safety because bleach actually is pretty strong smell. Actually, can even trigger asthma and other other issues. And also, bleach actually can damage certain surfaces because very strong oxidants. So that's to watch out. You want to actually uh, you want to pay attention to when you use bleach. Okay, good point. Um, this is a question from Beth, and she says, when I swapped areas in college for microbiology, I rarely picked up bacteria from doorknobs or metal surfaces, the wood door. Why do they always talk about doorknobs when you talk about, you know, cleaning certain surfaces of high-touch areas? Yes, yeah, great question. So the high-touch areas, uh, the terminology actually I borrowed from the medical settings. For the medical settings, we divided all the surfaces into two. One is called high touch, you know, areas. One is, you know, the common areas. So the high touch areas means actually will be frequently touched by different people, and apparently the doorknob actually is one of them because you know when you go out, go in, you have to touch the doorknob. As a matter of fact, the test study we discussed for the norovirus, norovirus actually contaminated the diaper changing station, but people touch that one and then consequently touch the doorknob. That's why it got transmitted. That's why you know the doorknob actually is very important. If you do a study to try to detect you know the pathogens from the common areas, the doorknob actually usually is on the top list. You can detect all kinds of different pathogens. Okay, great. Um, well, if anyone else has any additional questions, please submit them now. Um, one question that I have, Yatel, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some studies have suggested recently that uh, this would be maybe more in like a home setting, but that our homes are too clean and may actually be causing allergies um, because we're not used to, uh, you know, some being exposed to different things. What, what do you think about those types of studies? Uh, actually, I appreciate you asking the question. I didn't get a time to talk about that one. That actually is called a hygiene hypothesis. The hygiene hypothesis actually has been realized for the past decade. And there's a study actually compared the developing country and the developed countries. For example, they compared the autoimmune disease percentage in the United States and Canada with the developing countries in Russia and in Africa. The number actually is very shocking. For the United States and Canada, the autoimmune you know, disease, the percentage wise, is about a one in fifty. So it's a pretty shocking number. That's why here we hear a lot, you know, people allergic to all different things, right? Even chocolate, all the things, all the different things. And in Africa and uh, Russia actually the autoimmune disease percentage is only about one in fifteen countries. So you can see the difference here. Then people try to dig out. So what is the reason here? So one hypothesis actually is because we use uh, you know disinfectants very frequently, even at home. So we kind of like maintain our home settings, you know, very clean environment. However, you have to bear in mind, even let's say for human being, microbes actually is a very important part of human being. One mammalian cells corresponding to nine bacteria in human. So are we really bacteria or you know mammalian cells? That's an open question. And the people realize that early childhood infection actually is an important part to build our immune system. That's why you know the hygiene we have to watch out. And for home settings, actually, personally speaking, I don't recommend that to do a very you know I don't recommend to do over hygiene. Even like my home, actually, my child, I don't actually wipe down all the time. Actually, I let them to exposure to certain environments. However, for some other environment, for example, for the hospital settings or you know for the school settings, because you have so crowded environment, so and it's different settings. So you probably want to take different approach. For example, you want to take the precaution to prevent 
any you know optimistic pathogens. But I'm glad you asked the question. Great question. Great, thank you. Um, another question came in. Our school district uses a citrus cleaning agent named germicidal. It gets diluted for classroom use. Have you heard of this cleaning agent, and is the dilution use as effective? So for any particular product, as I mentioned, so you want to actually watch out, you know, at least the two things. The first thing is, does it have an EPA registration number? Because EPA uh, actually has a very rigorous, you know, testing protocol. You have to pass the testing protocol to be qualified as a sanitizer or disinfectant. That's the first thing you want to watch out. The second thing you actually want to watch out actually is the instruction for use, which including the contact time and any you know dilution ratio or is. And for the dilutable product, uh, I would personally actually trying to suggest actually you have to be you know very careful with the instruction because when you do the dilution, not only that you know potential error you know we mess up with the dilution ratio, but also that actually possibility we may contract, you know, with a high concentrated chemicals cause some, you know, safety concerns. So I would suggest you to use called ITU, ready to use product. So that actually give you another layer of, you know, protection. So you don't have to do any dilution. So to answer your question, look for EPA registration and check out for the instruction for use, especially contact time and the dilution ratio. Yeah, those are really good tips. Okay, well, I um, we've covered all of our questions, so uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a special offer for our webinar attendees only. Until May 29th, you can buy three canisters of Cava Wipes One with that one minute kill time, and receive a free box of the Bionex hand towel. You use promo code METRICS1 at checkout to receive your free product. This is a great opportunity to either try some new infection control products or restock your cabinets for the rest of the school year. We will also include the details of this offer in your follow-up email, so don't worry about writing everything down right now. And next slide. Um, Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We had over 800 people register for this two-part series. So clearly, it is a really important topic. Um, and I think, especially with the recent headlines, it's given us a lot of reasons to revisit our policies and procedures. We hope that you found everything, all the information useful. I'd like to thank our presenter, Yatao Liu, for spending two afternoons with us sharing his wealth of knowledge. Watch your inbox for the follow-up email from us. That will be coming in about five business days. That will include the link to both of the recordings, your certificate of attendance, um, and uh, copies of the presentation slides, and a link um, to these products that we mentioned today, as well as the promotional information. Um, and if you would like to, uh, at the end of this, webinar, you can have the opportunity to take a very brief five-question survey. I apologize for those of you that attended yesterday. The survey did not um, come up, but it should when we close today's um, presentation. So please give us your feedback um, to help us improve or to let us know that we did a good job. We do review everyone's feedback. And that will end today's broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us.